Or you can use the short title in the slide uh, title. <laughs> Good afternoon. I hope you're all refreshed with a little bit of coffee and so on. Um, okay. In 2014, I published a book on the history of triathlon in Australia. I began research on the project in 2010. Uh, it seems that the Australian triathlon community was very happy to have a qualified historian voluntarily and free of charge set about researching and writing up the sport's history. In 2011, I was appointed to the newly reinvigorated Triathlon Australia Awards Committee and found myself debating who should be nominated for the 2012 inductions into its Hall of Fame. In April 2012, I attended the Celebration of Champions dinner, where a whole range of awards were given, culminating in the induction of three women. Emma Carney, Jackie Fairweather, and Loretta Harrop into the Hall of Fame. The inductees represented a particular phase in Australia's triathlon history, and were known for their strong personalities and interpersonal rivalries. The joint interview with the three inductees at the end of the night made for an entertain, entertaining and somehow cathartic finale for the evening. There was no doubt that the women were deserving, but the committee felt, uh, strongly felt like it was playing catch up and that there were many other worthy candidates who had not yet been inducted to the Triathlon Australia Hall of Fame, or TAHOF for short. Members of the triathlon public felt the same and sub subsequently raised questions about the Hall of Fame nomination process. Attempting to rationalise and justify its decisions, the awards committee subsequently drafted what is known as the TANAR document, which can be found on the official Triathlon Australia website if you click enough buttons and use the right prompts and so on. Although Triathlon Australia has one of the most uh, substantial and meticulous awards policies available for pu public scrutiny, members of both the committee and the Triathlon public still periodically subject those policies to further reflection. A recent debate about uh, recognition of contributors to the sport, I'll explain that a bit later, left me thinking more deeply about the purpose of the HOF and what it offers to the triathlon community. For the first time, I began to think about the HOF as a form of public history. In many ways, sports history has tended to function as public history, both in form and purpose. By public, I'm referring to communities outside the halls of academia. Many sport historians are not academics, with doctorates talking to each other uh, through peer-reviewed journals or sporting colloquiums. They are enthusiasts who reminisce in digital or face-to-face -face, uh, uh, social contexts, hoard every piece of paper relating to their sporting experience, and exaggerate the conditions of the sporting competition in the days gone by, and also exaggerate how fast they were as well. Or they might be the authors of niche nostalgic uh, books that repeat the sporting mythologies that first saw, circulated as oral traditions, usually over a beer or something like that after the last event um, in the early days. Then of course there are curators and museologists who bring ap academic training to their presentation of sporting pasts. However, until recent times, academic sport historians have been very wary about the histories produced by sports museums and of course the vernacular histories of sporting enthusiasts. Until recent decades, a distinct divide has existed between public and scholarly sport history practice. As long-serving director of England's National Football Museum, Kevin Moore, affirmed in 2013, academic sports historians see little value in sports museums. They view museum exhibitions as a less valid form of history than written academic history and alleged that museums present uncritical, celebratory histories. Gesturing towards a long history of scholarly scepticism, Ray Van Plew suggested in 1998 that sport mu museums evoke inaccurate vernacular mythologies about a sporting golden age. For other sport hist history scholars, these concerns tend to combine with a view that museums are mostly limited and selective cus custodial institutions, or that they simply commodify nostalgia. In addition, they doubt that the exhibits in museum displays, which are meant to be accessible and appealing to the public uh, that such institutions are designed to serve, offer scope to capture the subtleties of historical argument and analysis. This divide is gradually collapsing as historians and museologists applying insights from the cultural turn have interrogated the form of non-written historical texts and the way they function as narrative elements. 
Further, drawing on scholarly studies of collective memory, sports historians like Graham uh, Osmond, uh, Gary Osmond, have suggested that the many different acts of social memory embedded in diverse history telling endeavours, whether academic, institutional, informal or oral, are in themselves intrinsically revealing. Building on these new ways of understanding public sports history, Murray Phillips edited a collection of papers published in 2012, in which historians used to, working with the professionally approved artifact, that is the article, the book, the thesis, etc., look over the shoulder of the museum team. Their brief was to attempt to comprehend the ways in which the sporting past is represented in sports museums. The halls of fame considered in Phillips' collection were physical museum-like institutions with walls, doors and material exhibits, like the National Baseball Hall of uh, Fame in um, uh, Cooperstown, New York. I would like to argue that lessons too may be learned from the study of non-physical halls of fame like Tarhoff, their nomination policies and the outcome of those nominations and that those policies and nominations tell us something about the sport's collective memory. In reverse, understanding the relationship between Hoff policies and sporting collective memory may help sports governing bodies and community sport historians to frame Hoff selection policies in a nuanced, reflective and purposeful manner. Until recent decades, a distinct Sports historians interested in acts of memory, social memory, that selectively isolate aspects of sport, the sporting past and weave in individual memories into a broader historical template that might serve a collective sporting, geographic, political, economic or other purpose, readily borrow from uh, Benedict Anderson's notion of nation as an imagined community. Some consider the ways in which sport intersects with specific understandings of nation, such as Mark Dyson's work on baseball, basketball and football as American national pastimes. Others interrogate the linkages between collective memory and the imagined sporting community. It is instructive, for example, that Hill, Moore and Wood began their study of sport history and heritage with a chapter entitled Sport History and Imagined Pasts. In the view of many sports historians, imagined sporting pasts are used to validate either sporting or geographic community identities. Neil Skinner and Matthew Taylor, for example, apply uh, another historian's uh, argument uh, that the specific meanings of the term community, um, they apply their study of the specific meanings of the term community to their study of boxing communities in London. Sport historians have included uh, Halls of Fame in their study of the linkage between public history, collective memory, sport and notions of community. In particular, they point to the heavy symbolism placed upon individual sporting figures. And this is what Skinner and Taylor did. They argue, as a boxer progressed through the ranks, they observed that he could become, come to be seen as representing wider communities, the population of a town or city, region, and perhaps even an entire nation. Much like statues, which Gary Osmond uh, et al note, implicitly refer to things other than themselves, Hall of Fame exhibits can convey as much about community identities as they do about the personal histories of the sporting figures they ostensibly seek to present present to the public. In other words, our, our Hall of Fame uh, uh, um, inductions, inductees, become heavily symbolic. And quite a number of historians have pointed to this. As Jeff Coe argues, Halls of Fame depend specifically on the public profiles and established images of sports stars to portray a particular positive and appealing version of sport history. Making reference to the American National Baseball Hall of Fame, Coe suggests that they can even attach a pseudo-religious aura to select individuals and tend to immortalise sporting champions, particularly if they evoke that notion of a golden age. The sports history literature regarding Hall of Fames uh, relates to, as I mentioned, physical museum-like institutions, which often represent corporate or commercial interests as well as sporting ones, rather than the policies uh, informing the selection of Hall of Fame inductees for honor honorary recognition by sporting clubs or volunteer-run national government bodies. So now I want to turn to those policies. <coughs> I want to look at a handful of Hall of Fame policies. In fact, although I've listed a few here, I've got many, many more that I could put up, but I've only got 20 minutes. And I'm only going to talk about one of those policies in detail, and that's AURA, the Australian Ultra Runners Association. Uh, I am by no means an authority about AURA. Um, 
uh, other than having competed in a few Aura events. And Peter, possibly you've competed in a few as well? Yeah, of course you might have. <laughs> um, uh, you should ask Peter about his uh, exploits. Quite interesting. Um, uh, but uh, I, the Aura uh, uh, case study, even with a limited knowledge of its history, still offers us some insights and an interesting uh, perspective on how Hall of Fame uh, policies and inductions uh, work to create a sense of community or hopefully create a sense of community. Now, you may not get it from that little summary that I have there, but the Aura Hall of Fame policy to me seems to be contradictory. It imposes a key restriction that inductees must be members of Aura and can only be nominated by other Aura members. It would suggest that um, the Hall of Fame is not targeted towards Australians at large or even sporting Australians or other runners or athletes. In addition, the language of the criteria suggests a fair degree of shared sporting capital. It re refers to recognised FKTs, outstanding feats and extreme solo runs in a manner that assumes that those who peruse the policy would understand what those terms mean at a variety of levels. In some ways, the Aura Hof uh, policy appears to represent a series of acts of social memory that imagine a specific ultra-running past and thus evokes a collective memory for the, uh, a specific ultra-running community. And yet the first line on the Aura Hall of Fame webpage proclaims that Australia can be proud of her ultra-running heritage and her very accomplished ultra-runners. That is, it addresses the Australian public and appears to assert some importance for ultra-runners to the Australian public. The imagined community is framed by privileged knowledge and the custodians of that knowledge authoritatively inform the Australian public of the significance of the achievements of her ultra-runners. My question is why? If it's such a narrow, exclusive, uh, community that is being used to formulate these policies, why address the rest of Australia uh, with the outcomes of those policies? Is this purely a well-meaning official struggling to find the sentiment that attaches a sufficient degree of importance to their sport? Or is the sentiment prompted by a deeper and more complex set of challenges facing the ultra-running community? A preliminary investigation suggests a number of possibilities. The Orof-Hoff policy was first accepted and enacted in March 2016, so only a year ago. However, the Hall of Fame has existed for more than a decade. Inductees were previously honoured on a case-by-case -case basis in the absence of a guiding policy, and those cases reveal a distinct focus on the deep past. The most recent career honoured in the Orof-Hoff is that of Brian Smith. Described as the greatest Australian-born ultra-runner of all time, Smith, according to Aura, the Aura website, died suddenly on the 28th day of 2001 Trans-Australia race and will be remembered as, remembered as a true gentleman of the sport. The Aura of the brief uh, biography on Smith in the Hall of, Hall of Fame um, webpage clearly knew the athlete and referred to him by his first, first name rather than his surname. The uh, biography rings of respect, loss and a desire for Smith's feats to be remembered. Yet Smith was not inducted into the Aura Hall of Fame in 2004 when the Hall of Fame was established. Instead, the 2004 annual report included a one-off history of ultra running uh, of only a few paragraphs and located the first four Aura inductees against that account. The history did two specific things. It used the inductees as markers of key turning points in the sports past and thus conveyed a sense of evolution and growth. And the second thing it did is it used measures of international success to give meaning to the achievements of Australia's Australian uh, ultra-running athletes and their performances, and thus through them to tell the broader story of ultra-running in Australia. So again, we have the individuals being used as uh, symbols and markers and becoming heavily laden with the narrative of the sports past, the imagined past. The inaugural inductions can easily, easily be understood as an attempt to create a collective memory for the ultra-running community through a select handful of talented athletes. But I still think more is needed to understand this seemingly quite sudden interest in ultra-running's past, ultra past. 
In the year 2000, the Aura Committee featured a complete slate of new office bearers. The previous team had held their positions since 1987. 1987 through to 2000, the same committee, the same office bearers, etc., uh, were in place. And then suddenly it all changed. A period of an in adjustment inevitably followed. In 2002, the third new president in three years, Ian Cornelius, appears to have brought a degree of stability to the committee. In fact, 2002 seems to mark the start of a new era. Aura set itself a five-year plan, joined the Australian Athletics Federation, primarily, primarily to boost its insurance options, resources and marketing potential, and inaugurated the Brian Smith Award, which rec aimed at annual, annually recognising outstanding contributions to the sport. Within this environment of change, a man called Phil Essam joined the committee as vice president. It seems that Essam held a specific interest in ultra running history. We've talked before to, earlier today about um, uh, individual champions, and he was the individual champ champion of ultra running history. It, that was the thing that he wanted to, to get up. The Aura hit website history page points directly to a resource that was originally established and run by Phil Essam uh, called Ultra Legends. Please don't look at the website yourself. The uh, link uh, no longer works and it takes you to um, a very um, a, a web page with very graphic pornographic images. Uh, it wasn't an intended part of my research. But anyhow, Essen became quite ill in the second half of the first decade of the 20th century and he stepped down from the committee after serving for two years. Uh, clearly, he also relinquished the claim to his ultra legend domain. No further Hoff inductions were made after Essen's departure. And in 2007, there was no Brian Smith Award. It was resurrected in 2008, but this time as an award for the best 24 hour performance over the previous year. While the membership boomed and the committee embraced new levels of technology and accountability, no further Hoff inductions were made until 2016, last year. The year that Aura laid out its first formal Hall of Fame policy. If it seems possible that a period of reflection and change triggered the original 2004 attempt to evoke an imagined community through acts of social memory, that is the induction of a number of people into the Hall of Fame, it seems even more likely that change triggered Aura's resurrection of the Hall of Fame in 2016. As the policy statement explains, growing participation and growing numbers of candidates were the catalyst for formalising the Hall of Fame process. In 2016, as in 2004, the committee also featured a collective brand, a collection of brand new office bearers. In 2004, Aura recognised individual athletes whom the committee associated with key turning points in the sports history before the original long-serving office bearers took up their post in 1987. The inductions of the 2016 um, uh, Hall of Fame, uh, the 2016 inductions into the Hall of Fame, roughly covered the period governed by the founding committee through the 1980s and the 1990s. Key to the committee Hall of Fame selections, however, was the same commitment to recognising groundbreaking landmark performances. As before, it seems that, whether intentional or not, the Hoff inductees implicitly played a role as markers in the narrative of the sport's imagined past. In the absence of any other acts of social memory, the Hall of Fame thus offers Aura's chief mechanism for evoking an imagined community that exists beyond the memory and experience of its many new members. I, I, I'm, I am near the end. Uh, okay, I'll just skip forward now <laughs> uh, and focus on a number of triathlon halls of fame. I'm gonna skip through these fairly quickly. There's just a few things I wanna take away from these. This slide features details regarding the United States, Canada, and the International Triathlon Union Hall of Fames. All three recognise a diverse group of people. Canada and the United States recognise two different groups of athletes, elites and age groupers. The ITU only recognises elite athletes, but all three recognise another group that is not mentioned in uh, Aura uh, to the same extent, and that is contributors. That is um, uh, people involved in government, governance, administration, race directing, media, etc, etc. But the complexity and diversity of the tri Triathlon Hall, Hall of Fames go further uh, than just simply a greater diversity of people that they're recognising. In the triathlon present, there is no single sporting community, even though it might seem to be the case. 
There are diverse imagined pasts and competing narratives, and there are many tensions embedded within those narratives. The sport consists of three arms, Ironman, Olympic, and age group triathlon. The Ironman arm is commercial and emphasizes endurance. The Olympic arm, as might be supposed, is composed of non-governing non bodies and features a distance and format that is more media friendly than the epic ordeals of the Ironman arm. Both stage world championship events with systems of qualifiers and long uh, around the world. The age group arm is not a separate entity, does not have separate governance, but rather is a mass of people who do both Olympic and um, ITU uh, triathlons and, and non, uh, the, the, the more formal triathlons from the Olympic arm. They cherry pick the races according to their own circumstances and goals. Some age groupers identify with the sporting communities that make triathlon possible, but many are simply recreational consumers, much like the new body of people that joined Aura. For the United States, acts of memory like the Hall of Fame help to bury the uncomfortable truths about this divided uh, um, history and these div uh, divisions within the sport by placing importance on its pioneer mythology, its um, uh, place as the uh, originating nation for uh, modern triathlon. On the other hand, Canada's detailed Hall of Fame policy makes no mention of pioneers. What was pivotal to Canada's story is its involvement in the foundation of the ITU, the International Triathlon Union. Uh, it was the president of uh, Triathlon Canada, who was the first president and long-serving president of the International Triathlon Union, Les McDonald. Um, so uh, Canada focuses on that story, that collective memory, in its Hall of Fame inductions. Uh, an interesting feature of the Canadian policy is not only its allowance for inductions of members from the age group community, as with the United States, but also its willingness to include the age group community in the nomination process as well. So we see a very strong sense of inclusion of uh, age groupers in the Triathlon Canada story, and also in the United States stories. Both the United States and Canada and the International Triathlon Union, as I mentioned, also include contributors in their Hall of Fame. And they have all acted on their, uh, um, that policy by inducting every year some contributors to their Halls of Fame. Both Canada and uh, uh, um, the United States have also inducted age groupers into the Hall of Fame. But in Australia, it's different. Oh, I didn't include the Australian um, details. Never mind, I'll tell you. In the minus one minute, I've got remaining. <laughs> um, for the Australian Hall of Fame, there is no inclusion of age groupers. Age groupers are not included as el eligible for the Hall of Fame. In addition, the Tarhoff Statement does allow for contributors to be inducted to the Hall of Fame, but so far, there have been no contributors inducted to the Hall of Fame. And it was actually a debate about whether or not contributors should be, given that we are potentially they're eligible, that led me to this whole um, uh, discussion and exploration and research. Why is it that the Australian triathlon story does not seem to want to include anything other than elite athletes? Now, this is the thing. There's a couple of things. First of all, there is a common thread in many Australian sporting stories, collective sporting stories, that focus on what's called the imaginary grandstand, the international perspective, measuring up to the rest of the world. So first of all, the Australian uh, triathlon story is shaped and framed by this notion of the international grandstand. Even though it might not be uh, consciously and deliberately, that's what I think is in part shaping the uh, collective memory uh, that uh, has been put to me during my, uh, all my triathlon research. And Australia's history does support that uh, collective memory, that, that version of Australian triathlon history. The second year that the International Triathlon Union held a triathlon world championship, it was an Australian, Greg Welch, who's there somewhere, who uh, won. And surprised the Americans and surprised the rest of the world, the kid from down under, the larrikin from down, un 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 down under, was the world champion. And the following year, the International Triathlon Union World Championships were held on the Gold Coast, here. And it was a young kid from the Gold Coast, Miles Stewart, who won the world championship. The following year, in drizzly old Manchester, uh, it was an Australian blonde, tall, long-legged woman, Makili Jones, who won the world championships. And she did it again the following year. 
1994, it was Emma Carney, who, an Australian from Victoria, who won the World Championships. 1995, uh, Jackie Gallagher came second. And in 1996, um, it was uh, Jackie Gallagher who came first. 1997, Emma Carney won again. 1998, Joe King from Victoria won again, or won for the first time, against a field of Australians who all held uh, Triathlon World Championship titles. In 1999, the first five women to finish were all Australians, and they all held uh, Triathlon World titles. So you can see that in, uh, for the 1990s, that was the golden age for the Australian Triathlon. That was the age, that was the era when Australia's dominated ITU Triathlon. And lo and behold, around the corner, we have the Olympics in Sydney, Australia. So you can see how the story of Australians, Aussie battlers taking on the world, might have some uh, currency. It has uh, a lot of evidence in terms of the achievements of Australians. And there will be many more um, uh, internationally uh, accredited triathlon, Australian triathletes who will also be inducted into the Hall of Fame. There is a, a, a story there that appeals not only to the Australian triathlon community, but also to that idea of, inter, uh, of Australians comparing themselves to the rest of the world. And to me, that is why I think there is resistance to inducting contributors into the Australian Hall of Fame. So my, my question is, there's obviously a bit of a downward slump of track on performance at the moment. If, do you see any relationship to any of this or community engagement or sport or the Hall of Fame? Is there any links to the performance? Very definitely. Um, uh, both guide in the uh, Hall of Fame nomination process and uh, just general community discussion. Uh, there, there's, you know, everyone's a critic. Everyone has a theory as to why Australia isn't achieving on the world stage in the way that it, it did previously. Uh, it all, of course, helps to enhance this idea of the golden age. Um, and uh, um, there is very much uh, a concern about what will happen in the future. Is uh, you know, how will Australian uh, the triathlon claw its way back? But the thing that I kind of omitted to stress towards the end there, because I just knew it was running out of time, is that um, the other threat is not just the lack of achievement in those sort of same um, fields, basically in the Olympic arm of the sport, but the growth of this um, uh, disconnected uh, mass of triathlon participants, you know, the, the recreational consumers who don't identify with the community, who don't identify with the sport's past, who, who basically uh, just do triathlon for their, their own you know, self-interest, and that's fine, but in terms of the triathlon community, there's this fear and this concern that what made the triathlon community in Australia exists in the past and not in the present. And we don't have anything in the present that, that generates that sort of like uh, sense of that desire to connect to it. You know, we don't have those gold medalists or we don't have those 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 characters like the Larrikin uh, Greg Welch or the the crop from Queensland is run with crocodiles, all those sorts of things, to kind of pull people back in and make them feel connected to um, uh, uh, the community at large. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jane. Any other, do you have any other quick just question? An observation. Yes, observation, great. Just, just an observation. It seems to be maybe a threat or a risk to all um, organised sport that we're going away from organised sport recreational, casual, opportunity-based sport, yeah, yeah. and maybe this culture that you talk of, coming back to um, the history, um, is a risk for all sports in their performance. It is, I mean, I think that's why, and to me, like in the, the further extension of this project, that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, is um, the, the function of these, these collective memory-making projects in trying to create a sense of something that might actually attract consumers um, beyond the finish line of their next triathlon or fun run. Uh, and yeah, 